thankful for all the different things that are going on to the, at our church. We're thankful for all the activities. I want to take a few moments just before we enter into the sermon to honor someone. Uh, most of you know that Sister Margaret Minner has been so faithful in doing our prayer chain here at the church. She handed it over to me on Monday, and I promptly messed it up. So I <laughs> took me till Friday to get it back to running like she had it running. So uh, she told me I can only do about nine to ten names on a group. Well, my phone let me do twenty. I didn't realize that was going to cause a lot of confusion. So it's back down just the way that she had it set up now. So hopefully we're running right. But I like what I told Brother Bill Vaughn. I got a little note that I've written from the church to Margaret that I stole a line from him. I didn't steal it because I gave him credit. So you can't get me for plagiarism. Brother Bill wrote, uh, thank you, Sister Margaret, for covering us all and taking care of us all through prayer. And that's what she's done. And I'll say this. If someone here, if you feel the Lord tugging on your heart that you'd like to help in this ministry, let me know. And and she was so faithful, people would send all their prayer requests to her. And I'm going to tell you, this church, we, we're close. We'll send you a prayer request at 11, 12, 1 in the morning. You never know when you might get one, 5 o'clock in the morning. But she was so faithful to respond and get that out. So this is a, just a small thing. This is a gardenia bush. And what I love about this, these have such a beautiful fragrance. <laughs> I'll tell you that Margaret Mentor has brought a beautiful fragrance into this church and all the lives that she knows. And Margaret, I won't make you come up, but I'm going to bring it to you. But would you give her a hand right now? Yes, Dan, that's great. Thank you, for, thank you for all your faithful work. We love you. At this time, our youth and our children can be dismissed for their ministries. Thank God for all those who take part in that. I want to remind you, if you're here visiting for the first time or if you're visiting with us and you've never gotten a visitor gift, we have a little visitor station to your right when you come in. and I'll appoint Karen, if she will, to make sure she's there. And If anyone's visiting with us, you be sure there's some good stuff in there. In your bulletin, there's a handout, and it's an invite, so you can invite people to our Good Friday service, which we'll be, we'll be uh, remembering the Lord's body through communion on Friday. We're going to remember what He's done for us, and we're going to go through the stations of the cross on Friday at 6, 6. And then there's also, uh, on the other side, inviting them to our Easter service. There are some people, they call them CEOs in the church world, and that's Christmas and Easter only. But that's the only time they come, is Christmas and Easter. I say, thank the Lord they come those two times. That's two occasions to let them know this great story of Jesus. So take this time, if you would, and invite someone and, and let them know that the Lord loves them and we love them as well. As you know, it's Palm Sunday, and I'm going to be sharing some from that in just a few moments from Luke, the 19th chapter. But I read a story about a little boy on Palm Sunday, he was sick, and his older brother saw a, a good chance, and he says, Mom and Dad, y'all going to church, I'll stay home with brother. I'm, I'll, I'll watch after him. So he thought, man, I missed it. I dodged that bullet. I'm getting out of church for once. And that day, his mom and dad came in carrying a little palm branch like this, and the, little, the children said, Mom and Daddy, what's that palm branch for? What's that palm leaf for? And the dad said, well, this palm branch is what we took, you know, what was used to lay before Jesus as he came in and entered in. And the little boy, he didn't finish the sentence. He meant enter into the city of Jerusalem, but as he entered in, and the oldest brother said, wouldn't you know it, the Sunday you and I miss church, Jesus shows up. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, Jesus is always showing up, and I'm thankful for that. But as I've been preparing this sermon for you as a... Uh, uh, the title is The Tears, Cheers, and Jeers of Palm Sunday. I will be honest with you, this uh, sermon, as I've prepared it, I've found that my heart is broken with the heart of our Lord. And uh, even though we look at Palm Sunday and we talk about the sense of celebration on that day, it is foreshadowed by a Savior looking over Jerusalem and weeping. 
because he knows that the worship and the praise is shallow. And I'll share with you starting Luke, the 19th chapter. I'm going to drop down. Well, I'll go ahead and start at verse 18, I mean 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending to, up Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpads and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. He sent two disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in which at your inner you shall find a colt tied, wherein yet an ever man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Thus you should say to him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found him, and as he had said unto them. And as they were loosening the colt, the owner thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus and cast their garments upon the colt and set Jesus thereon. And as he went, he spread, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now into the descent of the Mount Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all, my, for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to the highest. And some of the Pharisees among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke the disciples. And he said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If that hast known even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong unto, thy, uh, belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass about thee and keep thee on every side, and shall lay even thee with, even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. He went to the temple, and he began to cast out the they that are sold therein, and that, that, that therein, and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could, not find, and could not find what they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. I know Matthew's gospel says they're trying to figure out what to do, and they say the whole world's gone after this Jesus. In this passage of Scripture, as I was reading it, and the thing that kept speaking to me, Jesus is getting ready to enter Jerusalem. In the 16th chapter of Luke, they're telling Jesus he better get gone because Herod's going to get him. And Jesus says to them, you tell that fox, you tell Herod that I've got to go to Jerusalem. I ain't got time for him. This powerfully, I ain't got time for him because I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And then he goes on to say, because Jerusalem's where the prophets are stoned. Jerusalem's where the prophets are cut asunder. And he makes that statement that we'll find later on in Matthew 27. He says, Jerusalem, how I would have longed to have you to gather you none myself. I'd have done you like a hen doth her brood. I'd have gathered you under my wings and protected you. But you would not. When we see Jesus crying, we find that Luke 16, Matthew 27 lets us know that he's crying because he knows there's going to be those who will reject him. And he's crying because he knows what that's going to bring to them. He looks at Jerusalem in this scripture, he says, if you just knew the joy that could be yours... If you knew the hour of your visitation, if you knew that God was seeking an audience with you, but you're rejecting that, and because you're rejecting that, you're going to be compassed. They're going to, Tiberius would come and he would starve them out. He'd put barricades around Jerusalem. And then after he starved them out, he burned them out. And he made ruin of the temple some 70 years later. See, I'm going to tell you, that when Jesus, and he's seeing that day, and he's saying these things don't have to be 
but because of your rejection, they're coming your way, and he weeps. We're starting with the tears of Palm Sunday. Those tears come from a Savior who will cry for those who won't choose him. Next time someone says to you, how could a good, loving God send people to hell? Your response should be, he doesn't send them to hell. They choose hell. I know that sounds harsh, but it's the gospel truth. In this scripture, Jesus is weeping because he knows the end. He knows what some people are going to experience. And that breaks his heart and he weeps. But in his sovereignty, in his... I don't know if y'all have heard of Jordan Peterson or not, but Jordan Peterson, he's from Canada. Uh, he's a brilliant guy in some ways. And because he's this new thinker, he's on all these different shows. And Jordan Peterson started out as an atheist. I think he's on a journey. He was on a guy's... Uh, um, Joe Rogan, I don't know him that well, but he used to be on Fear Factor. He, Factor. He's got a podcast that's well known among the young people, the millennials. And while he's on Joe Rogan, this man who was once an atheist, they're talking about what's truth. And he had just toured the, the Bible Museum. And he said, I have just come to the conclusion that all truth comes from the Bible. It's a moral compass. And it always has been for this world. And this guy who's not a Christian finally just through the duck of reasoning says this Bible is moral truth. The last statement that he's made that's caused me to pray for him and I am praying for him because he has influence. We need to pray for those who are not saved. Especially if they're starting out at atheists, you pray hard. But he's a seeker. And the Bible still teaches that blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I'm convinced if someone's sincere and looking for the truth, they'll find themselves at the feet of Jesus because he is truth. That's where they'll end up. And the latest thing that Jordan Peterson has said is they ask him if he believed there was a creator and a God. And he said, I began to believe there has to be a creator because how everything is so unique. But if he's to be a God, he can't lord over people without their having their own will. For him to be a true God, he must let people have free moral choice. I'm thinking, Lord, you're leading that man. Because what we see Jesus display as he overlooks Jerusalem is a God who did not create robots. He did not create servants. But he created men and women with a free moral will. And as he cries, he cries because he lets me know there are some in their free moral will who will not choose him. Not only does he love those who don't respond, but it lets us know we can say yes or we can say no to this Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Salvation is a personal choice. There again, Matthew 23 and 37, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stone those are sent. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the, the way a hen gathers her chicks on her wings, but you are unwilling. He says, no, your will is keeping you from God's protection. Your will is keeping you from drawing nigh to God. 2 Peter 3 and 9, The Lord is not slow about His promises. Some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come repentance. That's God's heart. He wants all to come to repentance. That's what he wants to do. He wants to come and bring salvation in your heart. But then he lets us know it's according to our choice. John 3, 16. For whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believes. 
John 1, 11 and 12, He came to His own, and those who were, in, were His own did not receive Him. But as many received Him, to, he, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even those who believed in His name. He came unto His own. He came to the Jewish people, and they did not receive Him. But as many as did receive Him. Did you catch that? There were those who did not receive, and there are those who did. I hope this grips your heart like it's gripped mine this week. Folks, I grew up in church, and sometimes I take for granted this great gospel. But I'm going to tell you, it's a great gospel. <laughs> it's a tremendous gospel. I'm so thankful for my upbringing. But I'll tell you what happened to me as a young child. The Holy Spirit revealed to me I was a sinner. The Lord challenged me. I can remember, I'll go, I was five when the Lord first awoken something in my spirit. And it wasn't my emotions, and it wasn't somebody, something, somebody brainwashed me. At five, the Spirit of the Lord, I began to weep and weep and weep. And my daddy was saying, Gary, what's wrong? I said, I don't know, daddy, but I don't feel good. I don't feel right. I used the words of a five-year-old, but that five-year-old was saying that eternal truth. I'm not right with my God. I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. And I remember it was after church in Sterling, Georgia. My dad put his hands on me behind a pulpit and prayed for me, and I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And at that moment, I went from one who hadn't received to one who had I preach it this strongly because why I'm here behind this pulpit, there are those that have not yet received, and I want to see them switch teams. When I read this, I thought about, you know, you're speaking especially to the Jewish people. I share this story. When I first interviewed Seth to be our pastor, y'all know the story. Seth's dad is, is, is a Jew. He's a Jewish man. And he kept going to his rabbi saying, how can we be saved? We're not offering sacrifices. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And the rabbis never gave him a sufficient answer. So one day he picked up a Bible and he began to read. And when he looked at Jesus, he said, there it is. There's the shedding of blood. There's the sacrifice. And what happened was Seth's dad changed the whole trajectory of his whole family because he went from someone who did not receive to one who had. Hallelujah. I'm praying, Father God, on this Palm Sunday, let us see your tears. And let us join with you in pleading and crying for those who aren't saved. Let us know there is coming a judgment day. And let's pray for the salvation of souls. I've got family that's not saved. And this week that has scared me and bothered me more than it has in the past. I'll confess that to you as pastor. As I've read this because our Lord weeps over those who have not come to him. William James once said it well, when you have not made a choice and don't make it, that's a choice in and of itself. Martin Luther has noted that Christianity could consist of positive pronouns. He said it is one thing to say Christ is a Savior. It's quite another thing to say Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. The devil can say the first, the true Christian alone can say the second, that he's my Savior and he's my Lord. Father God, help us know we must crown him or crucify him. That's our choice. Pilate's wife in Matthew 27, 19, this, I love this, Pilate's trying his best not to deal with Jesus. 
That's why he had him scourged, hoping that would suffice him. His next plan was, I'll offer him Barabbas or Jesus. Maybe that'll suffice him. He's not wanting to deal with Jesus. But one reason he's not wanting to deal with Jesus is Matthew 27 and 19. When he had sat down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Have nothing to do with him. That's why he would later on wash his hands. He's trying to get by with having nothing to do with Jesus. But let me tell you, Jesus for all eternity must be dealt with. You crown him or you crucify him. He's Lord or he's not. And on this Palm Sunday, it's crystal clear to us that message that we must choose him and call him Lord. Oh, hallelujah. I almost say this and then we'll try to go on. The Lord spoke this to my spirit. I believe he has. What we need to do with Jesus, there's three things I'm going to tell you we need to do with Jesus. First, we need to accept that offer. We need to accept, Lord, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. When the Bible talks about us speaking a word, the one word that's done un, un, unforgivable sin, I've had so many people come to me at times as a pastor, I think I've done this unforgivable sin. I think I blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. And my first response is, by you coming to me, lets me know you hadn't. Because you have a sense of conscience. That's why you're coming to me, you've got a sense of conscience. If you had blasphemed the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't have that sense. You wouldn't feel that drawing. But the second thing I let them know, the biggest thing about blaspheming the Holy Ghost, it's not just saying bad words or, or, or saying something evil against the Holy Spirit. We do need to be mindful of how we speak, but being blasphemous of the Holy Ghost is refusing His work. And right now, I keep sharing this, but this is just burning on my heart. Jesus said it's necessary. It's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter won't come. That third person of the Trinity won't come. I'm so convinced that right now, the third person of the Trinity, he's right here. He's not only with us, but he's in us. And he's working right now to testify of Jesus. And blaspheming the Holy Ghost is not hearing his message or his testimony that Jesus is the sacrifice, that Jesus is what we need. When the Spirit comes, He's not going to speak of Himself as what Jesus said, but He's going to testify of me. When you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost, you're speaking against His message. Folks, there's nothing greater that can be done for humanity than it's already been done on the cross of Calvary. There's not a plan B. Hallelujah. And because of that, you and I must accept Lord Jesus. You're, the price you prayed on that cross was enough for my sin. For my sin. We must accept the testimony of the Holy Spirit that convicted us of sin and convinces us of a better way. We accept that the second thing we must appropriate we need to apply or make access to that gift. I'll give you a crude example. I've had people give me gifts before, and I've never used them. Never took advantage of them. Years ago, somebody gave me a little power extender for your phone. It's just a little bar. might have been Eric and Linda. I don't know who gave it to me. But we were without power one day, and I'm digging around, and I found that thing in a box. Plugged in my phone to it and said, this is a great thing. Why haven't I used it before? Another example, back before Christmas, well, back around Black Friday, I bought us an air fryer. Bought it back in Thanksgiving. Used it for the first time about three weeks ago. Still in the box with the plastic around it. I had a gift. 
but I didn't appropriate, I didn't use it. There's a movie called All Brother, Where Art Thou? And I have watched it and laughed because the main reason I laugh, they talk like my kinfolk talked. One of the lines in the movie, the guy's talking about his wife, he says she's done run off, O-F-T. That's how my family talks. I laugh at that movie, but there's a very sad line in that movie because there's a young boy who supposedly sold his soul to the devil to play a guitar. And his line is, Tommy, you sold your everlasting soul to play a guitar? And the man replies, well, I wasn't using it anyway. What's so frightening to me is there are people right now who say that I know Jesus, I've accepted him, but they don't live it out. I believe some of the greatest revival that's going to hit America is going to start in the church where people are going to apply what they've heard and appropriate what's been said. We were here Wednesday night for a time of prayer and that's on our website if you want to go there. And I'll have, I would apologize, but I don't feel like I really need to. I'm leading us in this time of prayer and we're using the the, the disciples' prayer, the Lord's prayer as our outline. But Brother Jim, as we're praying, the Lord overwhelmed me. I don't know how, I, I feel like I was praying for the whole church. But what happened in that prayer, I was overwhelmed with the knowledge that because of the blood of Jesus and because of His work on the cross, that now I could come before my God boldly. And not only that, that my, it amazes me that God created us for this. When he made Adam, he made Adam for communion with him. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, the very first, I think there's 144 points there, something like that, that spells out our faith. The very first one says, what's the chief purpose of man? And the reply is to worship God and enjoy Him forever. That's the chief purpose of man. Folks, I'm here to tell you the cross. Jesus died not just to save us from destruction. He died to save us unto Himself. That, it's hard for me to believe this. But we see not when we were here praying... That God was in heaven waiting for it to hit 6.30. I got Eric and Linda here, and I love these people. Whenever they tell us they're coming to see us, I'll be honest with you. I'm antsy. I catch myself getting up and looking out the window to see if I see car lights. <laughs> I'm almost as bad as my little dog when he hears my truck pull up. He's at the door. But folks, I'm here to tell you that our God up in heaven created us to be with us. When he said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me in the Ten Commandments, in the Hebrew it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before my face. I don't want anything to get between me and you. And our God has created us that we may appropriate the gift and take advantage of being with our God. Oh, the peace we often forfeit. Oh, the needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. What a true line. We need to accept this God. We need to appropriate His blessings. And we need to appreciate what he's done. Hallelujah. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I know the Lord. I'm grateful for salvation. I'm grateful to be a minister. I hate to say it, 
But there's been times it sounds like I've talked about being a minister was a plague. <laughs> because there are burdens that come with the role. But I'm appreciative of God not only calling me to a side, but calling me to share this gospel. And I want to make sure I'm appreciative of this gift. I want to be like the one leper that comes back and says, I just got to give you thanks. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord. Because I do believe not everybody's going to heaven. And I do believe it takes more to go to heaven than just die. I believe Jesus wept for those who were going to say no. Aren't you glad that your name's written down in the Lamb's book of life? Well, I may pray, Lord, help us to appreciate what he's done. That's the tears of Palm Sunday. You don't have to sweat because the cheers and jeers is going to be much shorter. The cheers on that day as he enters Jerusalem and as the Pharisees say the whole world's gone after him. And they're laying their clothes in front of this donkey. And Zechariah 9 and 9 says that there's going to be coming one on a young colt that's never been broken. And that's going to be a sign to you that your salvation has come. So when they see Jesus, they begin to say, here's our salvation. We're going to be delivered from this Roman oppression. We're about to have the good old days. And they take off their coats and they lay the palm leaves because they don't even want the donkey's feet to get dirty. I love our little dog, but I ain't throwing my coat down to keep his feet from getting dirty. But they did that because they're saying, here comes the king. And they're saying, Hosanna, Lord, help us. That's what Hosanna simply means, help us, save us. I'm going to tell you, when I get in a pinch... Help's the first thing coming out of my mouth. I don't form some great grand soliloquy that they say, come help me. I don't say, Karen, where art thou, most beautiful, precious wife? Would thou come to my side and render some aid? If I'm caught in a pinch, Karen, come quick. Karen. Karen, put that iPad down. Come quick. <laughs> and now I need help now. Lord, save me when church is over. But that's what they were saying. Lord, get us out of this bind we're in. And I'm going to tell you, there are those right now, their praise is all about, Lord, what can you do for me? And they lose sight of, there again, the first point that his death, burial, and resurrection was about getting us back to the Lord where there's nothing between us. There are things all of us could say, Lord, I, some of you are getting ready for tax time and you're saying, save me from the IRS. Some of you are going through physical problems and I'm not demeaning them, but you're saying, Lord, save me from this ailment. But the main thing Jesus died for is to save us from sin that separates us from God and to remove that. Maybe you had not been as bad as me, but I'm thankful that Jesus took my sin on his cross so I can have the audience with my creator face to face. Oh, hallelujah. And I'll say this, going back to appropriate, I pray for you this week that you have so many God moments. By Easter Sunday, I hope you can say, Pastor, I was driving in my car, wasn't even thinking about you. And a song came on, and the next thing I knew, my, I was just giving praise to you. And I was spending time with you, my Lord. The Lord uses all kind of stuff to speak to me. Our, I'll share this and move on. Our dog, I, 
I'm going to turn half of you off with this story. I know it, at least half, because I used to be on that half. There are dog lovers and people who don't love dogs, people who get it and some people who don't love dogs. That's just how it worked. For 30-something years, I didn't have a dog in my house, but I do now. That's my new world. Not only do I have a dog in my house, he sleeps in our bed. Not only do I have a dog that sleeps in my bed, I'm getting a bigger bed this week because he's taking up too much room. He's costing me all kind of money. But me, who isn't a dog person, that dog's getting close to me. And he'll sleep up against me. And in the mornings, when I get up, he'll be half asleep, and that's when he's the sweetest. And what he'll do as soon as I get up, he rolls over on his back and he does, which means pet me. And he'll do that for a little bit, and then he'll go to his face, which means you come down here and you acknowledge me and kiss me. And your crazy pastor does. And when I lit up, he'll go back to... Now, I'm going to tell you, I know that's odd, and I hate to admit it, but I was doing that the other day, and the Lord said, Gary, just as that little dog, as he wants his master's attention, I want to give you attention, and I want to give you security. And are you begging for it? Are you longing for it? I'm convinced that was a God moment for me. And he can speak to us in so many different ways. And I pray, Lord, help us that we don't offer shallow praise when we don't realize the main reason Jesus died is to restore us back to fellowship with God. That we can truly enjoy his presence. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But I could say how many have spent an hour in prayer day to day this, this week or 15 minutes in prayer. How many has been intentional? I'm not saying it to be convicting, but I want to make sure our praise succeeds the praise of those that day that just called out to God when they were in a bind. Uh, Lord, if that was too hard, please take the sting out of it. But I do believe our God longs for us. And we want to make sure that our cheers are greater than the cheers on that day. That we let him know we love him. Oh, David says it like this in Psalms 27 8. When thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. We quote Second Chronicles 7 14 a lot about revival in our land. He says, you know, for if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Both of those, he didn't say seek my hand. Don't seek what I can do for you. You seek my face for fellowship. FaceTime. Oh. I love this thing called FaceTime where people don't, who don't usually get to see family can now. As a chaplain, we used it quite often when loved ones couldn't be with their loved one as they were passing away. I'll never forget one uh, man, his, his, his daughter's husband was stationed in Hawaii, and she wasn't going to be able to make it back before he died. But why he was still uh, able to, to, to reason, they got an iPad and called her, and he said, my baby, my beautiful baby, and he's patting that iPad. And she's saying, Daddy, I love you. you. You've been, everything I am is because of what you've done. And I'm watching this beautiful thing take place as a child gets to look face to face to their father and pour out their heart. And the heart of the father is poured out to the child. Let me tell you, <laughs> through Jesus, he's made a way for us all to have face time with the father. And Lord, help us take full advantage of that. I'm going to end with the jeers. We have the tears of Jesus. We have the cheers of the crowd. Then we have the jeers of those who don't want to come under his lordship. And at this time, it's the Pharisees. It's the priest of that day because they don't want to give up their, their, they don't want to give up their power. 
And it says, and he taught them in Luke 19, 47, 48, and he taught them daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief people sought to destroy him and could not find a way that they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. They are right now, they're saying, how can we destroy this Jesus? They're jeering, they're, they're hating him. And they're coming up with plans because we don't like his authority. He's taken away our power. Uh, Wednesday's called the day of silence in Holy Week. And it's because there's no recorded miracles or words of Jesus on Wednesday. But the Bible does record some words on Wednesdays. And those words are where the scribes and Pharisees come together and put this plot together to charge Jesus with blasphemy. On Wednesday, they come together with a plan to have him crucified. It was a day of silence from our Lord, but not from his critics. We live in a world right now where there are critics to this gospel. Because I made the statement earlier that you, it's a choice. And there are people who are going to end up in hell. There are some people who can look at that through the internet and I could be called bigoted because I'm saying God's not going to welcome everybody into heaven. But I'm here to tell you that's the gospel truth. And the people who hate it the most are those who don't want to yield to that message. They don't want any other God than themselves. Let me tell you right now, in our world, in our nation, there's spiritual wickedness in high places. And they jeer at this message because it's uncompromising. I don't know how many of these TV preachers who get in front of Oprah or somebody and they say, is Jesus the only way? And they'll cop out and say, that's above my pay grade. The reason they do that they know just as soon as they say Jesus is the only way that they'll meet with scorn. They'll meet with criticism. They'll be jeered. I'm here to say bring it on. Call me small-minded, narrow-minded. Narrow is the path. Straight is the way that leads to eternal life. It's the path I'm going to stay on. Though none go with me, Still I will follow. Hallelujah. Well, glory. I'll give you this example, and then I'll try to end this. Do you know how many people died in the world last year because of the cause of Christ? How many Christian martyrs died? 900,000. Nearly 1 billion people died last year in our world because they said Jesus is Lord and Savior. Have you saw that on your news? Have you heard of those? That's more than a pandemic. It's more than an epidemic. To have 900 Christians. Well, Lord help me. Y'all pray that I, I'm not making a political statement here. But this gripped me this past week. We had six people die at Covenant Christian School in Nashville. It's from a conservative Presbyterian church. They broke from PCUSA. In 1970, they stood and said that sexuality is determined by God. And they made that statement. They didn't buy into the new LGBTQ, whatever initials beyond that now. And because of that, we're finding right now that some of the way it's been portrayed on the news has been sickening to me. I've been like Jesus. I've wept. Some news agencies have said, don't mention that the shooter was transgender. Don't mention that. Don't mention. In fact, our president was asked before he went to speak by someone, do you agree with Congressman Holly that this is a hate crime towards Christmas, Christians? And our president, president laughed 
and said, I ain't going to agree with anything he says. Later on, they said, could this be a hate crime? And they said, well, we'll look at it. And because it happened to Christians, it hadn't, and, I don't, and I'm not getting political, but what I want you to know when I take up talk about being jeered, in this nation, if you stand for the cause of Christ, get ready to be criticized and called names and jeered. They had a rush upon the Capitol in Tennessee. They tried to break in. I don't know if, and there again, you hadn't seen much footage of that. It's been downplayed. But the people who broke in were holding up seven fingers. And while that was significant, they're saying it wasn't six victims, it was seven, because the transgender community is a victim in this nation. And their anger wasn't about the six deaths, but it's the seventh death. I hope. I'm not trying to depress any of you, but I'm trying to let you know the world we're living in. And when you stand for Jesus, there will be those who will jeer that. But let me tell you this, those who plot against God's work, they end up doing God's work. The Pharisees who thought they were, <laughs> Satan thought he was using them to do his bidding, but he did God's bidding because it was on the cross when God's work was done. And let me tell you, some of those who rise up against the church, I got a feeling it's going to be like in the early church. The more they come after us, the more it's going to spread this gospel. Oh, I read this. Uh, I feel led to share with you the names of those who died. Evelyn Dick, Dickhouse, her dad was a pastor. She's a nine-year-old girl. Mike Hill was a 61-year-old custodian they called Big Mike. Catherine Coots was the head of the school, the schoolmaster. She was also a dear friend of Stephen Curtis Chapman. And when his daughter was uh, killed in a horrible accident, when his son accidentally didn't see her and hit her with his car and his daughter is killed, it's Catherine Coots who counsels his family and texts his sons and when she dies they send out all these beautiful words how that she helped save them they also say she ran towards the shooter some said they thought that she was probably running to the shooter not just to stop him but to try to help that shooter find peace that would be her nature Haley Scruggs a nine year old girl William Kim Kenny a nine year old boy Audrey Hale was the, the transgender woman who did this. But when I saw on the news and still watch how it's being betrayed, and you can look now. Government, there are some government officials right now, they're focusing on guns, and they're focusing on the transgender community and them not getting the love they need, rather than focusing on how Christians can be prosecuted and persecuted. And there again, you haven't heard about 900,000 that died last year. I say that to say to us on this Palm Sunday, may we make sure that we know the tears of Jesus and know that we can choose to believe and we can be on the right team. Not only that, that we can accept Him, we can appropriate, we can be in His presence. And we need to appreciate that moment. God, help us to make sure our praise isn't and our cry to him just isn't when we need him. Lord, save us. Help us out of this jam. And Lord, help toughen us up. Pray for your pastor. The Bible tells us that we shouldn't count it strange when we face these kind of these, <laughs> these temptations. But I still want to say, Lord, that hurts my feelings. I don't like it. But I pray God give us a holy resolve to follow Jesus no matter the cost. Would you stand with me?